Well, please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. That's, we are in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and uh, let me ask you this morning, how is your prayer life? Has your prayer life been different this year than the years before? And the reason I'm asking you is in the beginning of the year, sort of independent of one another, both Peter and I felt impressed upon our hearts the need for more prayer. Prayer for us as, as, as elders, but also to encourage and to uh, lead the church into greater uh, faithfulness in, in prayer. And uh, then, of course, by God's providence, we began this year studying Matthew 6, verse 9 to 15, which really deals with the Lord's Prayer or the disciples' prayer. So we had nine weeks on prayer. And uh, many of you have commented on that, on that mini-series and, and about the impact that it had, had on, your, on your prayer life. And then the very next week, on the 7th of March, Arlan preached for us, and his message was a prayer for Christ-likeness from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 21, where he uh, encouraged us that we should uh, uh, pray and ask for this, for, for, to be strengthened in our inner man by the strength of the Holy Spirit so that Christ would live in our hearts and so that as we are uh, rooted and grounded in love that we would be able to comprehend together with all the saints the, 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 the width and the, and the height and the, the breadth and the length of, of, of the love of Christ. Uh, that surpasses knowledge, and that we would be filled up to the fullness of God, and then that we would be, that God is more willing and able to give to us far more beyond that we could even think or ask. Uh, that was in March. And then in May, Aji preached for us from Daniel 9, and he preached on the characteristics of effective intercession that we should know the promises of God, we should believe the promises of God, we should confess our sins and our failures for not walking in the promises of God, and that we should petition the Lord based on His character for the fulfillment of His promises. And today we are in Matthew 7, verse 7 to 11, and lo and behold, it is about prayer. God's promise to the prayerful. Are you hearing him? Are you listening to the Lord? Are you heeding his word? Are you obeying his commandment to us? Do you pray frequently, fervently, faithfully, confidently, privately, publicly, unceasingly, at all times. James reminds us that we do not have because we do not ask. And we ask and do not receive because we want to spend it on our own pleasures instead on the purposes and plans of our Lord. The principle that in the words that that God gave Solomon at the dedication of the temple was that if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Second Chronicles 7.14. And Jeremiah and that invitation that God extended to Israel through Jeremiah is, I believe, is as applicable to us today, where the Lord called upon His people, say, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know, in Jeremiah 3, 33. And so this morning we come in the Lord's Sermon on the Mount to, to chapter 7, and, and we have seen verses 1 and 2 that uh, we should not be hypocritical people, that we should not be judgmental. 
uh, nor should we be hypocritical uh, or uncritical. And now our passage suddenly takes a, a shift to, to the topic of prayer. Um, and this shift to prayer is really not divorced from the context. Jesus was well aware of our human faults, our failures, our frailties. Uh, for us, pardon me. <coughs> I'm just getting over a cold. <clears throat> um, and for us to have any hope of obeying these commandments, we need help. We need God's help. So this is, this is not a digression, but a logical progression after such commandments that really challenges us to the core of our nature. And then he goes back to the same topic in verse 12 when he says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. In this is the law and the prophets. So Jesus is here commanding us to ask what we need for. We've heard before that the currency of the kingdom is prayer. If you want something in the kingdom of God, then you have to ask the king. You have to ask God, uh, ask him for our needs. Uh, so current, the, the currency of the kingdom is, is prayer. Uh, and so this morning, let's read Matthew 7 from verse 7 <clears throat> through to 11 and find um, this amazing promise that the Lord gives his people. Verse 7 reads, <clears throat> Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will not give him a snake, will he? <clears throat> if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Let's ask the Lord to help us. <clears throat> Father, we pray this morning that we come asking, Lord, we come seeking, we come knocking, Lord, for your blessing upon us this morning as we sit in the, uh, under the ministry of your word. Father, through your spirit, speak to us, move us, awake us, uh, encourage us, stir us up, Lord, so that we would obey this commandment that we have in this passage this morning. Uh, help us, Lord, to be undistracted from it, and that we would uh, have resolve in our hearts to live according to it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so here in this passage, we, we find this, this God's promise to the prayerful. And it's a, first of all, it's a command with a promise, but then there is also conditions to this promise. And so first of all, a command with a promise. And what an amazing and astounding promise it is. To those who ask, to those who seek, to those who knock, they will receive, they will find, and it will be opened up to them. And so it's important for us to understand this promise. And first of all, this promise, as I said, is a command. It's in the imperative. It's as good as the Lord says, I command you to ask, I command you to seek, I command you to knock. And the promise is that those who are obedient to this command do this and you will have, I will, you will receive, you will find, you, it will be opened to you. And this is also not just the, 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 the original language. The command is in the, uh, what they call the present active tense. It's continuous. It's, it's, it, the command is not just ask once, but ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. No, don't stop after one or two attempts. No, no, keep on doing this. Keep on coming to the Lord. Persist in prayer. Persevere in prayer. Continue in prayer. And you would say, well, well, prayer is not in this passage, Franz. I don't see the word prayer. And, and, and you are right. It is not in the passage. The word prayer is not in the passage. But the context 
of that whole passage is about prayer. And if you go over to Luke 11, where he specifically teaches on prayer, he uses the same um, command structure of asking, of seeking, of finding. So this is, this is all about prayer. So how does asking and seeking and knocking relate to prayer would be a good question I hear you ask. Uh, and uh, so let's look at each of these things. Is, 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 is this just a, another way of saying the same thing differently and, and as for emphasis? Or, or does, it, does it mean something different for each of those commands? And so the asking one would be ask and it will be given to you. For everyone who asks, <laughs> receives. And so asking is really... In relation to prayer, it is, it is our petitions, our requests, our intercessions that we direct to our Heavenly Father. Asking was often used as a synonym for prayer in the Bible. Uh, Jesus taught his disciples to say, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. June, uh, sorry, John 14, 13. And so many of our prayers are asking prayers. We are a needy people, and we need, to, we need to come, and God wants us to come to ask. We ask for what we need in Jesus' name, uh, according to the will of the Father, as led by the Spirit. And so we ask Him to provide for us. We ask Him to act on our behalf. We ask Him to protect us, to lead us. And so asking is really simply straightforward, the opening up our mouth and asking the Lord for what we need. Then we come to the next one, seek. Seek and you will find. For those who seek, finds. This is a little bit of a wider meaning to just the words that we pray. This involves our action, our efforts, as we look for the answers, God's answers to our prayer. And so it is diligently seeking God's will in relation to our prayers. It is diligently searching the scriptures. So seeking prayer really is prayerful action. If we need wisdom, then we pray for wisdom while seeking his word for the wisdom that is to be found there. Proverbs 2 tells us, it talks about wisdom in a personified way as, as someone really desirable. It says, if you seek her, this is wisdom, as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And so from his mouth is what we have, his word. So if you want wisdom, ask for wisdom, and then go and look for wisdom, seek wisdom from the scriptures. If you need direction in regards to decisions that you need to make, choices that you have, well, you pray, Lord, help me in this decision, give me that direction, and then you seek for that direction in the scriptures. Because his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So action prayer is a praying for direction, for guidance, for the ways in which I should go while seeking from the word the answer to our prayer. And so often people come and make pretty bad choices. And when you talk to them about them, ask them about it, they say, no, no, I, I prayed about that. And, and it just felt right. I felt led to this decision. The question is, have you actually opened the Bible? Have you actually searched the scriptures for guidance from God's word? And more often than not, the answer would be no. And so what happened is they prayed, which means they did ask the Lord for help, but then they contemplate their own thoughts, uninformed by the Word of God, which is rich in principles and priorities to guide every single decision that we need to make. See, the Word of God is sufficient for life and godliness. And so seeking prayer is searching the Word it takes effort, diligence, 
humility. And so don't be lazy, don't be prideful, don't be deceived. Don't follow your own desires while claiming it to be that of the Holy Spirit leading you. Because if your decision violates God's revealed will and any of His principles uh, and priorities and directions we have in the Bible, which is, by the way, revealed to us by the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures, then guess what? If your decision violates any of that, then your decision is not Spirit-led. It is self-led. You are not following God's mind. You are following your own mind or the world's mind. And so seeking prayer is action prayer. It is actively looking to discover God's plan and purposes in relation to your prayer. And if you look in the right places, <clears throat> the promise is you will find, you will discover. That is a promise. So action prayer is seeking the Lord's precepts, and that will give you actually immense freedom. Uh, the Lord gives us incredible scope in the choices that we can make freely. He does not legislate for every single thing. He gives us general principles. And as we seek those principles and apply those principles, we have great freedom in what we can choose. So really seeking speaks of, of a more intense prayer as it involves not just asking but taking action. And, and we have other examples of, of how we can do this in Scripture uh, in, in, uh, in 1st Chronicles 16.11, which is the same as Psalm 105, we read the psalmist say, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face continually. Now, if you are praying, Lord, I want to draw closer to you. I want to, sp I want to spend time with you. I want to seek your face. Then pray for it and then start looking for ways in which that may happen. Spend time in the Word of God. Action prayer. Romans 2 verse 7 says, To those who persevere in doing good, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. So pray for that. And then you go ahead and seek out what is good to do that. Seek out what is glorious to God, honorable to God, and of eternal value. It's action prayer. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2, 3. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So prayerfully seek the things that are Christ. What are the things that are Christ? Well, on this earth, He is building His church. So if you're praying and seeking to do that through evangelism, through discipleship, then you are actively praying, but also looking for the ways in which that prayer can be answered, can be fulfilled. He loves His bride, Ephesians tells us, and, and he was willing to sacrifice for his bride. He was willing to sanctify her with the washing of the word. He was nourishing her and cherishing her. And so when you pray that, Lord, help me that I would keep my eyes on you, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, then at the same time, start looking for how you can do that practically. And this wonderful truth is, is when you seek and you keep on seeking, God promises you that you will find, you will discover, He will show you. He says, come to me, seek from me, says the Lord. And so it's a command to ask, it's a command to seek, and now a command to knock. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now, whenever the word knock is used in, in the New Testament, it's really to alert the occupants of a, of a house that someone's at the door. Their, their presence is there. And they are really summoning someone to come to the door. And we, of course, see that in Acts 13, when, when Peter was, was in jail, 
sorry, not Acts 13, Acts 12, uh, uh, Peter was, was, was incarcerated in jail, and the, it says that the, ch the church was making fervent prayer for him, and then the, an angel appeared and basically uh, broke Peter out of jail, and he went to the house where this prayer meeting was on, and what did he do? He knocked on the door, and little Rhoda came running, and he answered the door, and she left him there and went back in again. Uh, but it was the, the knocking was to summon someone to come. Come open up to me. Uh, in Luke 12, verse 35 and 36, Jesus was, 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 was teaching his disciples to be ready for his return. Uh, so that when he knocks, when he announces his presence, when he's, when, he's, when he's come back, he summons us to open the door. We read that, be dressed in readiness. And keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Pardon me. <coughs> also, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, a famous verse, I stand at the door and knock. And here we read of, of Jesus really standing uh, at the door of the lukewarm Laodicean church, alerting them to his presence, really desiring, offering them the opportunity to open up to him so that he can come into them and have fellowship with him. And so here in our passages, of course, it's the disciple of Christ who is doing the knocking. And we are knocking at the throne room of God to open up his door, the door to all his heavenly provisions. It's a prayerful knocking so that we can have our felt needs met. We have many needs, and, it's, and, it, and the Lord wants us to come and ask for us, for that. But most critically, this prayerful knocking is for the Lord to open us so that we can meet with Him, so that we can have fellowship with Him. And we need Him most Certainly, when it comes to us obeying these very commands, not to be hypercritical, hypocritical, or uncritical. It's only when we are in fellowship with Him that we will be able to discern these things. It's only when the Lord opens to us and we enter into sweet fellowship with Him that we are being transformed, that we are changed, when we abide in Him. People will say to us, well, they have been with Jesus. Just as they said about the apostles, there was something different about them. Why? Because they have been with Jesus. And we can be with Jesus every day. When we come to him through prayer, knocking, Lord, I seek fellowship with you. Open up to me. Lord, here I am. I'm here, Lord. I want to have intimate communion with you. And the promise is, He will open for you. You will experience wonderful fellowship with the Lord. That is the promise. Come, ask. Come, seek. Come, knock. It's an incredible promise. A, a, a wonderful, marvelous promise that God makes to those who ask and seek and knock. Is, is that your experience? I pray that it is. I pray that it's true of you. But I would also s suspect that for many of us it's not. Why? Well, because there are some conditions to this promise. And at first, when we read this, it looks very much like a blank check. Everyone who asks will receive. Anyone who seeks will find. Everyone who knocks, it will be open to. But really, there are three conditions that need to be met. And that is first the credentials of the one praying, then the commitment of the one praying, and then the character of the one to whom we pray. And the first two are really dependent on us, on who we are and what we do, and the third one is, is dependent on the Lord, 
on his character. He will not give us something that will hurt us or harm us. He will not give us something that, will, that, is, that is really against his own character, no matter how we plead for it. And so first one, let's look at the credentials of the one praying. It says, everyone, everyone who asks, that's pretty comprehensive on a straight reading of it. That seems like a bit of a blank check. It seems like an unconditional promise. So are there qualifications to this promise? And the answer is most definitely there is. And the context determined that. The immediate context, but then also the wider biblical context place qualifications, conditions on who this everyone is. Of course, everyone refers to those who are in Christ, first and foremost. Those have, who are believers, those who are Christians, Christ's disciples. And we read in Matthew 5, verse 1 and 2, that his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach. So this whole Sermon on the Mount was directed primarily, first and foremost, to the disciples. Yes, there's little doubt that the Pharisees and the, the, and the, and the, and the scribes and others were listening in on this message, but it was primarily directed at those who are his disciples. Furthermore, there are references of being brothers and of a heavenly father. And this points again to the truth that it is for believers, that is for those who are, can call God their heavenly father, who have brothers and sisters in Christ. So everyone is everyone who is in God's family. Everyone who has received Christ as Lord and Savior, to them, God gives the right to become children of God. Those who believed in His name, those born of blood, and not of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So the question is, are you in Christ? Have you repented? Have you turned away from your sin and do you trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Are you in the faith? Paul encourages us in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test. And so the test here is, is called the test, the test of the faith. This, this, this is an emphasis on the body of truth, the doctrine that you need to believe in order to be a Christian. The doctrines of the gospel, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, that judgment is coming, that there is eternal hell or eternal life that awaits that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived in sinless perfection, in perfect righteousness, fulfilling the law of God, that he died on the cross, was buried and was raised to life on the third day, that he ascended to heaven, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, that he sent his Holy Spirit as a helper to those who believe in him, that he is interceding for the saints and that he will return to rule and to reign and to judge. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have counted the cost of following Jesus, that you have denied yourself, pick up your cross? Because the gift of salvation is free, but it will cost you your life. Meaning that you no longer live for yourself, but for him who saved you. A life that you would give up gladly if you have faith. If you understand and believe the amazing grace shown to you. And so everyone is everyone who is in Christ. And therefore everyone refers to those who have a singular devotion to God. Matthew 6.24 that is those that have set their love on God and God alone and not seeking to serve both God and mammon. You can't worship both God and mammon. So that everyone is here who is singularly devoted to God. 
Everyone here is those who are, are seeking the will of God and not seeking their own will. Who therefore would ask and seek and, and knock according to His will. 1 John 5.22, this is the confidence we have before Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Early on in the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, it's when we pray that God's will be done, God's kingdom come so that His name would be hallowed and not our pleasures and that which pleases us. And so everyone is also those who are prayed with sanctified motives. James 4, 3 says, you ask and you do not receive because, receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Everyone are those who, who pray by faith, in faith. James tells us that when we lack wisdom that we should ask and he will give us f- without uh, reproach and with liberality, but we should ask without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Everyone is those who live in obedience to Christ's commandments. 1 John 3.22 And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So no, this is not a blank check. This is not everyone, does not mean all and every single person with their unsanctified desires and agendas. This is those who are seeking and knocking to fulfill the Lord's desires, the Lord's will, who has set their heart on Christ. This is the everyone to whom this promise relates. Now, of course, in the immediate context, it's the whole promise to, to those who are seeking and knocking and, and asking in relation to our relationship with others. How appropriate to ask the Father for help so that we would not be judgmental hypocritical, how important it is to to ask the Lord so that we not be hypocritical, how appropriate it is for us to ask the Lord for wisdom so that we can be critical, discerning, discriminating against those who could rightly be termed dogs and hogs, whose response against to the, the holy and precious thing of the kingdom of, uh, of, of heaven is rejection, ridicule, hostility. And if we pray for these things, the Lord promises you He will answer you. And of course, there is a broader context to this, this prayer. And that it revolves the whole Sermon on the Mount. That when a disciple of Christ comes asking, seeking, knocking to receive, to find, to enter into the things that Jesus expounded for us in the Sermon on the Mount. The, the, really the manifesto of the kingdom of heaven. Praying that the characteristics of the kingdom that's as defined for us in the Beatitudes would be true of us and growing in it. Praying that we would be displaying kingdom conduct by being salt and light to the world. Praying that the, by the Lord's grace that, and in His enabling power that we would live out kingdom righteousness. That we would practice our worship, our giving, our fasting, our prayer with sanctified motives. That we would be singularly devoted to the King and His kingdom, not distracted by the riches of this world, nor by our own needs in it. But have a heart set on Christ and His kingdom first and foremost, knowing that all these other things will be granted to us. It's an amazing promise. A promise that our Heavenly Father will answer on the condition that we belong to Him and that we have our hearts set on Him, on His plan and His purposes, His will. And so it depends on our credentials. Are you someone like that? Is that your desire? Is that your hope? And if it's not, then ask for it. Seek for it. Knock to find it. 
It's also dependent on the commitment of the one praying. And we've touched on this before, that this relates to a commandment to ask, to seek, to knock. And so the promise is to those who does that, who, 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 who are obedient to this commandment. And we also said that it is a continual, ongoing commandment. It, re- it, it requires a ob- continual obedience to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. It's not infrequent or irregular or intermittent prayer. No, it is persistent prayer. It's persevering in asking, seeking, and knocking. It requires continual commitment. And of course, this is applicable to, to a single request that you may have, that you, something that's on your heart that you are seeking the Lord for. Like the widow who was, who was coming before the unrighteous just, uh, sorry, judge seeking legal protection. And the Lord encouraged his disciples through that uh, parable not to lose heart, but to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking fervently, frequently, faithfully, and you will receive. So it has application for a specific request, but it has also application, I think, for a, a life of ongoing prayer. It really says the same, it's really saying what Paul said to the Thessalonian church is pray without ceasing. Keep on praying. Have a life of prayer. And like the Ephesian church, pray with all prayer and petition at all times in the Spirit, being on the alert with all perseverance for all the saints. And the promise is, is that prayerful and f- uh, yeah. Prayerful, the prayerful and the faithful in prayer, the committed to prayer, they will receive from God. And so we see the credentials of the one praying and the commitment of the one praying. And then critically, the character of the one to whom we pray, the character of our heavenly Father. And the truth of this promise rests squarely on the character of our Heavenly Father. His, his promise is sure, and His promise is, is really qualified by who He is, based on who our Heavenly Father is. And so here in verses 9 to 11, uh, Jesus led his disciples to consider, to compare, and to ultimate, co- ultimately conclude that the Heavenly Father is the only one that will give us what is good. So we can receive what we ask to find, to open, according to his character. He is our heavenly Father, our loving Father, our powerful Father, our good Father, and our faithful Father. And so consider this, verses 9 and 10. What man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he not give him a snake, will he? And really here it is (coughs) drawing from something that they would know and see. And so he's going to say, consider this. Consider uh, just normal relationship of a loving father with his son. Um, if, if a son asks you for bread, will, will a loving father give him actually a stone? Or if a, if a, if a, if a son asks for fish, will a loving father give him a, a snake? And of course, to understand that, there's a stone... <coughs> The Sermon on the Mount was just next to, to the Sea of Galilee, and, and uh, there's a lot of limestone around that. And, and with, uh, as, as part of these uh, limestone break down through erosion, they form these little round pebbles or stones that looks very much like a loaf of bread. On the outside, it's brown, and the inside, when you break it open, it's white because of the, of the limestone. Uh, and so he's saying that, will a father, a loving father, give... A child deceive his child, really, is, 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 the, is the thrust here, by giving him something that could actually physically harm him or emotionally hurt him when he discovers his father's deception. 
Will, will, will a loving father do that? And they all would say, no, of course not. Or what about uh, giving him a snake when he asks for, for fish? And, and again, at the Sea of Galilee, they, they were uh, found uh, uh, eels as well as, of course, all the other creatures, but there were eels as well. And eels uh, were prohibited by Mosaic law to the Jews. They're not allowed to eat it. If it didn't have fins or scales, then if it comes out of the water, you're not allowed to, to eat that. And so he's saying that would, would a father cons- give a son something unclean to eat when he asks for fish? And it's like inconceivable, really. A, lo- a loving father would never deliberately give his son something that would defile him, that would hurt him, that would harm him. Our Father never mocks our prayers, and our Heavenly Father never gives us a double-edged gift, a gift that may appear good, but is actually bad for us. Um, There's this story in Greek mythology about Aurora, the goddess of the dawn, who fell in love with a mortal named uh, Tinnitus. So it's not, not Tinnitus there, but Tinnitus. Uh, and and uh, King, King Zeus, or, or rather the god Zeus, who was the king of the gods, decided to grant Aurora a gift. And she asked that Tinnitus could live forever. And of course, King Zeus gave her that request. But she failed to ask that Tinnitus would also remain forever young. And so Tinnitus lived and lived and grew older and older and older and older. And the gift ultimately turned into a curse. And God is never like that. God never gives us something that is bad for us or will turn out bad for us. And so Jesus asked them, uh, if you then, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? He's asking them to compare this loving Father that they all would agree would not do such a thing. Now, if, if, if a loving Father, yet He is evil, that He is sinful, meaning He's imperfect, He's depraved, you will see, actually, Jesus affirms the doctrine of depravity here because he actually distances himself from his disciples. He says, you being evil, if we know, of course, that Jesus did not have a sinful nature. But here he is he's, he's saying that if fallen fathers would give good gifts to their sons, how much more will a perfect heavenly father not give you perfect good gifts? And really the only conclusion that can be drawn is that, yes, absolutely, a heavenly father is one who gives good gifts. And so people, if, if Christ, if you are in Christ, if you are a Christian, if you are born again, blood bought believer in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you have God as your heavenly Father. And if that is so, that should make your toes curl up with delight. It should really move your heart to a deep peace and thankfulness. Because what can go wrong? I have God as my Father. And He's not just any Father, He is a heavenly Father. A heavenly father is unlike any human father that ever lived on this earth. Where our human fathers fail us, sadly some may even harm us and deceive us because of their sin, their selfishness, their pride, their lack of love. But that is never true of our heavenly father. He is holy. He is perfect in every attribute and characteristic he may possess. He is a loving father. His love is steadfast and sure, unwavering. It never waxes, it never wanes, it never ebbs and flows. It is steadfast, the same, perfectly so. The Old Testament teach that God's love for his children is is chesed love, which means it's a steadfast love, it's a loyal love. 
It is unwavering and unaltering. It is often translated as loving kindness. And his loving kindness is everlasting. 26 times in Psalm 136, Psalmist says, Your loving kindness is everlasting. And 183 times in the rest of the Old Testament, repeats his chesed love for his people. Once he has set his love on you, it never fails. It never changes. No matter what you do. Yes, it affects if we sin, it affects our relationship, but his love for us never changes. The New Testament talks about God's love as agape love. That is an action love, a love that is expressed in grace and mercy and compassion, a love that seeks the benefit of the one loved. And so Christ, our Savior, really is the ultimate example of God's agape love for us, that He manifested His love for us through Christ, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And his love qualifies his answers to our prayers. He will not give us something that's bad for us. Furthermore, he is a powerful father. He is, in fact, the only father who can make a promise. Because he is the only one who is able to keep his promise. Why? Because he is all-powerful. None of us, our promises really means much. Why? Because we do not have the power to make it happen. God has the power to make it happen. So we can ask, we can seek, we can knock. And we will know that he can answer. and He will be faithful to his promise because he is loving and because he is powerful. He is loving and able to give us what we need when we need it, and how much of it we may need. He is powerful. I remember as, as, as kids, little boys, we, we used to boast about our dads, about the strength of our dads. And one would say, ah, my dad's faster or stronger than your dad. And my dad can hold me up with one arm. And then the other one would go, <laughs> my dad can hold me up with one finger. And of course, we're all this nonsense. And it's outrageous claims. But our Heavenly Father, He puts boundaries on the sea. Our Heavenly Father puts the stars in skies and names them. Our Heavenly Father commands the sun to rise, to shine on both the wicked and the good. Our Father has storehouses of snow. He tells the lightning bolt where it should go. Our Father is awesome. How much more will your heavenly Father give what is good? How much more? There's no restriction apart from His own character. He will not give us that violates His own character because He is a good Father. A good Father gives good gifts to His children. Every good thing given and every perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow, James 1.17 tells us. Lamentation 3.25, the Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. Ask, seek, knock. God will give you what is good for you. A good father can be trusted. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of His goodness. Psalm 35, uh, 33.5. Psalm 34, eight. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. The Lord is good, people. He's a good Father. And sadly, that is one of the first things we doubt when things go wrong, when, when life becomes difficult, when we have health struggles, wealth struggles, relationship struggles, when we have problems in our marriage, trouble with our kids, trouble at work, 
when we are discontent with our circumstances, being unfulfilled in life, when we don't get what we want or think we, we, we need or desire, then we doubt God's goodness. And we start to act and think as those who do not trust in Him, who do not call out to Him. Because we don't pray for Him because God obviously doesn't care, is the mindset. People, a good God is a God that can be trusted. And our Heavenly Father is a good Father. A good Father teaches us and instructs us in the way that we should go. He revealed His will to us. Psalm 119 verse 68, You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes, the psalmist pleads. Psalm 25, 8, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore He teaches sinners in, in the way. A good father is also a patient father. None of us can claim perfection. The Lord is showing incredible mercy and patience with us, tolerance. Romans 2, 4, do not despise the riches of His goodness and the tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads us to repentance. God knows our weaknesses and our frailties even before we come to Him. And He is a patient God. <laughs> but He's also a Father who disciplines His children. A benevolent Heavenly Father is a Father who chastises his children, when they walk in deliberate sin. And so it would be an error to make or to believe that God's patience should be confused with acceptance of our deeds. He has provided everything for us to overcome this world. His Son, His grace, His mercy, his spirit, his word. And if we fail to call on him, to cry out to him, to seek him, to knock, and we stray and are unrepentant, then as our earthly fathers discipline us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he will discipline us for our good so that we may share His holiness. And so our Heavenly Father is a loving Father. He's a powerful Father. He's a good Father. And He is a faithful Father. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? Our Heavenly Father is holy in love, limitless in power. He gives good gifts to his children. And he is faithful, trustworthy. He is the God of truth. When he makes a promise like this, you can stand on it. You can believe it. You can trust it. Why? Because he cannot lie. It is impossible for him to lie. His word is truth. He declared himself to be the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. That word truth can also be translated as faithfulness. When God makes us a promise and we experience something different to that, it's not because of Him. He is faithful. When we come and we ask and we seek and we knock, then He promises us, you will receive, you will find, it will be opened to you. And so he has 
called us to prayer from the beginning of this year and intermittently throughout until now. He has taught us how to pray. And today he promises us that when we pray, that he will answer according to his character. So will we be a people that pray, a people that seek his face, knowing that we do not have because we do not ask? Let us not be like that. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would indeed be a people who pray fervently, frequently, faithfully, Lord. Oh, Lord, help us to set our hearts upon you, to be singularly devoted to you, to seek your will and your ways and your desires and not our own, Lord. Sanctify our motives, Lord. Purify our hearts, Lord. so that we would seek the things that are honoring to you and pleasing to you and have the promise that you hear us and will answer us according to your character. How blessed we are, Lord, as a people to have a God like you as our God, a heavenly Father, a loving Father, a powerful Father, a good Father, and a faithful Father. And it's in Jesus' name that we come and give thanks. Amen.